Good evening. My name is Dave Rosenstein. I'm a member of Community Board 8, and this is our monthly interview show, Community Board 8 Speaks. Welcome. Um, Board 8, as you can see from the uh, map on your monitor, covers the Upper East Side from 59th Street to 96th Street, from 5th Avenue to the East River, as well as Roosevelt Island. We'll be talking a little more about that island in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, our guest tonight is uh, James G. Uh, Jim Kleins. Jim, welcome. Very. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, Jim's a graduate of uh, Villanova, undergraduate with a B.S. in business, and he received his law degree at Notre Dame. That's right. Tonight's guest is no stranger to this show. Uh, his experience in insurance law made him the perfect candidate after Hurricane Sandy to interview Elizabeth Malone of the New York Mortgage Coalition about flood insurance. Incidentally, that interview is archived on our website. Um, Jim, you were also... An, Another one of these. Uh... Absolutely, Dave. Uh, I was very grateful that you and Will and the Communications Committee of the Community Board 8 invited myself as well as Judy Schneider. We, uh, at that time, were co-chairs of the Youth and Education Committee. And we were lucky enough to uh, come on our show, Community Board 8's show, Community Board 8 Speaks, where we talked about the need at that time. It must have been, boy, it uh, may have been five years ago, six years ago, about the need for more schools and more school say, uh, seats within Community Board 8. It was a great show, and I'm very grateful to be back. It's, uh, Jim was also an ADA with the uh, Nassau County District Attorney's Office for six years. Uh, you've held several positions on the Community Board. You co-chaired the Cornell Technion Roosevelt Island Task Force, served on our Housing and Street Life Committee, as you mentioned, Education, and on the Borough President's Immigrant Rights Task Force. I'm particularly interested in this extraordinary uh, Cornell project coming to Roosevelt Island. Um, what was it like to help shepherd the creation of an entirely new major university right here in our district? It was a great experience and it's continuing to be a great experience and it's the the good thing to report is that the residents are wel welcoming it with uh, open arms. Um, they are looking forward to it. The residents of Roosevelt Island realize uh, what a great plus it's going to be for the island. Um, a couple of years ago, if anybody were to walk mm -hmm. down Main Street, you would find vacant storefronts. Um, there was the one grocery store in town at the very end where the parking garages were. Um, there just weren't the stores there to serve the population. Now, all of a sudden, restaurants are arriving. Starbucks has even arrived. Better <laughs> restaurants. Uh, more stores. So I think it's just going to be great. And with Cornell University, as a uh, longtime resident myself of Ithaca, New York, I'm certainly familiar with um, Cornell University as being one of the best Ivy League uh, schools of higher education. And uh, the fact that they would chose, choose Roosevelt Island in our district to start this enormous project um, is incredible, and we're all very lucky. Now, that was a task force, and they've completed their, their work, and now the Roosevelt Island Committee is following this as it goes along. For viewers, what's the difference between a task force and a committee? Why are we structured that way? Sure. Task force has a single defined life to it. Um, they are given a task by the board chair, who at that time was Nick Vias, who um, I've replaced as of January, and the task was to serve as the sounding board, to serve as really the vehicle for the residents of Roosevelt Island, the business owners of Roosevelt Island, any stakeholder involved, including the representatives from Cornell University, to discuss what the project was going to be, how it would impact the community, and to uh, make it as the best project, but also the least disruptive to the normal um, island life. I believe that we have completed that task. Uh, ground break, ground breaking will soon occur, very soon. Um, so now we slowly leave it back into the hands of the Roosevelt Island Committee. Um, every board member of Community Board 8 that lives on Roosevelt Island, and we have at the moment four, they're all members of our Roosevelt Island um, committee. So they will continue to serve as the uh, point people 
in terms of this project, and um, I think it's, it's going to be very good for everybody uh, concerned. There's going to be uh, much open space, new open green space. Um, there will be a residential tower for the students and the faculty, along with classrooms, and it will bring not only Cornell but New York City to the forefront in terms of the tech business. Our, our April meeting has traditionally been on Roosevelt Island. Will it be again this year? Um, that's a good point. I'm thinking of switching it to June only because, and I'm glad you brought it up, you'll, you're hearing it for the first tonight, I'd like to have an outdoor meeting on Roosevelt Island. And I think April will be a little bit sketchy in terms of the weather. I'd like to have the outdoor meeting on the plaza of the Four Freedoms Memorial. I think it would highlight the memorial. It will also bring focus to not only the community board for our own selfish reasons, but it also will bring focus to Roosevelt Island. So I think we'll switch the April meeting to June, strictly because of the weather and also because I do want to have an outdoor meeting. That's a really interesting idea. I hope it works out. Um, how long have you served on the community board? Nine years. I was appointed by Councilman Dan Gorodnik in 2006. Now, for viewers, uh, the council members make recommendations for um, half the board, and those recommendations have to be approved by the borough president. That's right. The um, structure of it is if you divide uh, each, there are 12 community boards in Manhattan, so if you divide each community board 50-50, uh, the borough president gets 50% of the appointees. Any council uh, members who serve in that district also get a percentage of appointees based on their constituents. So um, pretty much for the past nine years, it's been 50-50 in between the two council members that uh, encompass uh, Community Board District 8. Um, slowly, that, that's shifting somewhat. But yes, um, you can be appointed by your council member directly with the approval by the borough president, or you can be approved directly by the borough president. So the borough president has the last say in, in either case. Absolutely. Um, why did you first decide to apply for appointment to a community board? I, uh, fresh out of Notre Dame Law School, I started in public service. I was a prosecutor for almost seven years. Um, to me, that is public service, and I left for the private sector where I was a trial attorney for the Nationwide Insurance Company for almost 20 years, and I miss uh, public service. And uh, I'm active uh, in the community and other things. I'm active in uh, my church. But I did miss uh, pure public service. And I did see at that point nine years ago, admittedly, um, we were somewhat under the radar. And I saw an individual putting up a poster on a lamppost advertising an upcoming meeting. And I looked at it, read it went to the meeting. It happened to be a street life meeting. So I started going to street life meetings uh, for six months, as well as the full board meetings. And then um, after that period of time, I applied and I was appointed. So it's basically public service, wanting to be involved in the community, wanting to give back to the community. Now, being the board chair is, is, is a challenge. What made you decide to take that on? I'm very lucky. Uh, in those nine years of being a member, I, um, I guess I rose through the ranks. I had uh, served as a committee member of many committees. I served as a co-chair of many committees. And then I became first vice chair under um, Jackie Ludorf. I'm sorry, second vice chair for three years. And then I was first vice chair under our former chair, Nick Viest, who you've had on the show, as well as Jackie. And then um, after that, I decided, well, I might as well run for chair because I felt um, that I had done it, um, I've been tested, and um, that I would enjoy it. More power to you. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. <laughs> uh, it is. As a matter of fact, uh, my uh, iPhone voice mailbox is filling up very quickly. Uh, have you identified uh, any things you'd like to do differently as chair, uh, new policies, new procedures, new committees. You mentioned 
uh, having an outdoor meeting, which is a fascinating idea on, on Roosevelt Island. But There is a new committee, and I announced it at um, our February meeting. Um, we meet every month, if I could just segue. We have a full board meeting every month. It is open to the public. Um, our March meeting will be at the New York Blood Center, which is on 67th Street, in between 1st and 2nd Avenue. Um, it'll begin promptly at 6.30 p.m., and we have a public session. So you just sign up um, in order to speak at the public session by quarter to 7. And it's an open mic night. You can talk about anything that's on your mind, and you'll have one, two, possibly up to three minutes um, to tell us what's on your mind. It is the ultimate town hall experience. I know this is the city of New York, um, but uh, truly, community board, the full board meeting is your local town hall meeting. But um, to answer your question, I did announce that I'm going to be starting a technology committee, and that committee um, will be charged with the idea of bringing technology into and revving up our use of technology at the committee meetings, at the full board meetings, and also at our board office, bringing us up to speed. There is so much technology that can be used while we run, especially the full board meeting, and also to make us more efficient at the uh, board office level. Um, it was brought up to me as I spoke to people to ask them for their vote when I ran for chair, and it had come up, several board members did mention that, so I follow through by um, creating one, and right off the bat we have two chairs, which I'm very proud of, they're fairly uh, new chairs, Allison Kopp and Albert Barucco. So that committee will uh, be off and running. And the borough president has talked for a long time before becoming borough president about the, uh, the need to uh, involve the community to have web webcasting of community board meetings, uh, how it's going to be paid for is something you guys at the borough board level will be talking about, how's, who's going to do it. This, these are complex issues, but um, we're moving in the right direction, finally. I think we are, Dave. And at the last borough board meeting, <clears throat> I noticed uh, remote microphones up in the ceiling. I noticed we were surrounded by cameras on all four corners. And the borough board meetings are televised. And um, Gail Brewer is a, uh, definitely a, a tech borough president, and she does want to elevate uh, all the, I think, all the community boards in using technology. So we're following her lead, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Now, our challenge is it has to be portable because we beg, borrow, and, <clears throat> and uh, use facilities at various institutions when they're available. Right. So we don't have a room that's wired and ready. That's exactly. One of the challenges. <clears throat> it is a challenge, and I do know that um, our community board just below us, community board six, do televise their full board meetings. Uh, I am looking into that. I think one of the reasons is that the institution that they use is you're right. It's already wired and mic'd and ready to go. Um, the venues that we use are not, so that will uh, be a hurdle. But we'll get over that. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the top issues facing our community board? The top issue, I would say, number one, is the marine transfer station. Uh, we hope for the best, um, but we also want to prepare for the worst. So um, we are hoping that um, it does not go forward. The uh, community board eight has made not one, but two, but I think three resolutions, definitely being opposed to the marine transfer station that is being proposed to be built <clears throat> in the back of Asphalt Green. Why do we oppose that? Because Asphalt Green is a playground. It's a major athletic field, not only for uh, children and adults within Community Board 8, but uh, people all over the city go to it. It has an Olympic-sized pool that is used by the entire city of New York. The athletic fields have an active soccer league so if the marine transfer station, which is a, a garbage dump, garbage processing facility, if that were to be built, it's going to be built along the East River, right behind the playgrounds, right behind Asphalt Green, and in order to get the garbage to the marine transfer station, it would involve garbage trucks, hundreds a day, 
to go up this ramp and deliver the garbage to the marine transfer station. The ramp would bisect, mm -hmm. split a toddler playground. Now this is a playground for three-year-olds, carriages. It would split that to the right is the athletic fields where the um, high school and junior high and um, those age students play. So it's a, it's a dangerous uh, situation in all respects. And I know that uh, all the elected officials are fighting against it and doing everything possible to prevent it from going forward. Um, the Community Board 8, under the direction of our Environment and Sanitation Committee, have started our own letter writing campaign. We're writing letters to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, individual letters, not form letters, outlining exactly all of our reasons for opposing the building of the marine transfer station and why it has to be reconsidered and why there has to be a new hearing before the DEC so that we can show, listen, the information that you got the last time the permit was applied for is now outdated. You have to now listen to us because it's a total new game now. New population, more and more people, more and more traffic, and most importantly, as a result of Superstorm Sandy, new higher tidal tides, new higher waterfronts, which totally change all the previous statistics, the previous reports. It's now in a flood zone, whereas before it wasn't. That's the major key. So I'm hoping that we will open up the permitting process so that we can have another, another hearing. Now that structure they're building to take this uh, um, waste and, and put it onto barges, that's right on the Esplanade. The Esplanade is another big challenge for our community. It's falling apart. It's our, it's our park. It's not Riverside Park. That's right. It's all we've got on the river. Where, where are we with that? That's, um, it's, it's we're going forward. Uh, Congresswoman Maloney and I know Councilman Ben Kalos have uh, secured uh, a lot of funding in order to repair the Esplanade. And they're not just talking about patchwork or, or putting cement in any of the potholes. They're talking about fixing the pilings, creating, a, in effect, a new surface for the Esplanade, <coughs> excuse me, more open green space. So uh, we are going forward on that. Civitas is also playing a role. There's also a group, Friends of the Esplanade, that are, are helping us as well. Um, so I'm hoping that that will also go into effect. Now, the Second Avenue subway actually is going to be finished um, in less than two years. Uh, it's going to transform Second Avenue. That's got to be uh, a major <clears throat> game changer for the community, for the Upper East Side. So that, uh, is that on your, your radar? We've talked about um, uh, trying to protect small businesses as one issue, what the street's going to look like. Absolutely. Uh, that is a game changer. It is the largest, uh, I believe, the largest construction project that has ever occurred in our area. Um, once it is complete, I think it's no secret, property values will go up. Um, many, many more people will want to live there because it's so close to the subway. More and more retailers are going to want to open up on the 2nd Avenue corridor. So as a product of a small mom and pop store myself. My parents uh, raised me and uh, actually my uh, two brothers and four sisters in a hardware store and lumber yard. So I understand the plight of every single mom and pop store up and down the Second Avenue corridor. So we're gonna have to do everything possible to protect them. And I think we can do it through zoning, which is being done and has been done on the Upper West Side so that, um, especially I believe on Broadway, so that it won't, so that Second Avenue won't become just one big box store after another, that will do everything possible to save mom and pop stores, not only to save them, but to make sure that they do well financially. Also, the streetscape is going to be so important. It can't be a um, mixed match or a patchwork of individual uh, benches or, or light posts, if you will, or um, types of sidewalk material. I think, and I think everybody agrees, it has to be 
uniform and it has to look good and it has to be attractive and it has to attract people to our area. So we're working through the MTA as well as our Second Avenue Subway Task Force having streetscape meetings to make sure that the entire corridor is uniform and that it looks attractive. You uh, had an interview with a local reporter, I think it was Our Town, and, and uh, you, you were expressed a concern that we're still too unknown to many constituents. You said, and I agree, uh, the more visible we are, the more effective we will be, um, given that we have no budget for advertising announcements. Uh, how can we work towards that goal? I know we don't have a budget. You're right. We were unlike a city agency that would have a budget. Um, obviously, we have a budget to um, pay our uh, four um, staff members. Thank God. And the rent and, and, and the rent, rent and things like that. But you're right. We we don't we can't take out uh, <coughs> full page ads in the New York Times and uh, other things. But it's CB8 speaks this television show that you and Will do so well along with your communications committee. This is uh, our primary way to get our word out. And the email. The, the and the email. Emails. Because everybody that comes to our um, community board meetings, whether it's the committee level, full board, or <clears throat> the land use meetings, um, they fill out an attendance sheet and they give us their email address. And they check, do you want to receive our emails or do you not want to receive our emails? So slowly but surely, within the last, I would say, three years, we have been building up an email data bank so that when we send out a blast and I'll find out the exact number of emails, we pretty much cover a big territory. Also, I'm trying to encourage our local neighborhood newspaper, Our Town, to include our calendar of events uh, right within their paper, our committee meetings and our full board meetings. You, you might have answered some of this, but after nine years on the board, where do you see our strengths and where could we do better? Well, our strengths, uh, I think, um, are delivering uh, services that uh, to the city government that the people, the community, which is why we're there to begin with, uh, want us to do. I think our strength is the fact that we do have this public session and that private ch uh, previous board chairs have made every effort to make sure that anybody and everybody that wants to come and speak to us during our public session um, does have that opportunity. I think another strength is that the elected <clears throat> officials and their representatives come to these meetings and they can engage uh, with the members of the public afterwards or uh, during the meeting in terms of any issues that they have. Um, I think things are going great. I think um, well, obviously we can become more efficient in our meetings. Sometimes we may go too late which unfortunately then gives us a problem with the building where we're having the meeting because a lot of these venues um, very nicely are not charging us, but they run into a problem that if we run late, then they have to pay overtime, of course, um, to their building uh, employees. So we have to be careful in that regard. But other than that, I think everything is going great so far. More generally, how do you see the role of the community board and city government? Uh, some mayors have been... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Frustrated because they slow development and force a conversation rather than a fait accompli. Um, the current, I don't know what the current mayor's position is, but are local bodies like these um, important in city government? Do we matter? I think absolutely we do. And I know that we are listened to the elected officials. And I can remember when I first joined, and I won't mention them by name, but certain state agencies, um, I know for a fact just... Um, we're not listening to us. Now, as a result, I would say in the last two years, city and state agencies are definitely listening to us. Not only that, but um, <clears throat> city agencies, officials, um, borough commissioners or uh, commissioners of themselves are actually coming to our committee meetings. I had the unique opportunity of speaking to the new um, Department of Buildings uh, Commissioner uh, just a few nights ago, so, and he definitely has an interest in the community board. So I think the relationship between the community board and the city agencies has improved 100% within the last three years. They are listening to us. Well, we know the State Liquor Authority um, for many years 
didn't pay much attention to our concerns, and now they seem to be listening, and they've even set up a mechanism for taking community board <laughs> input into account. Absolutely, so that's real. They are. That's a real material change. Absolutely. Not only that, uh, but I do know it's recently been an, uh, announced. Uh, our borough president, Gal Brewer, is actually having someone from the State Liquor Authority coming to speak in her office, and she has invited um, all of the community board chairs, as well as any committees that are involved in liquor licenses, uh, to come to that meeting, to open up the dialogue. Well, um, we're kind of getting to the end of our, our show, but... Um, what have I missed? What have I not asked you that, that I should have? Is there anything in particular you want to focus on before uh, uh, we run out of time? No, um, I think you've covered everything, but I do wish that everybody um, come to our full board meeting, which is uh, March 18th. Um, um, it uh, will be at the Blood Center, which is at 67th Street, and between 1st and 2nd begins at 6.30. Come up and introduce yourself to me. Come up and introduce yourself to Dave. Come to our meetings. Go to our website, www.cb8m.com. CB obviously stands for Community Board. 8 is our district, and M is the uh, letter for Manhattan. So it's cb8m.com. Visit our website. Come to our meetings. And uh, jump in, and the water's warm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and, uh, and thank you for joining us.